We got five? Five, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna make it quick. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aaron Willis. And I'm the director of the Bannon Forum in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education. Um, and I'm honored to welcome you all to our first event organized with one, by one of our 2019-2020 Bannon Fellows, How Jesuit Education Informs Business Leadership in Silicon Valley. The purpose behind our series of Bannon Fellows events is to help illuminate and activate the Jesuit mission of the university. 
This series will span academic disciplines and explores our mission's dynamism and ongoing evolution through the teaching and scholarship of our faculty. Given that we are the Jesuit University in Silicon Valley, it's fitting to open with an event that examines how this educational tradition informs leaders in Silicon Valley and beyond. Our panel today will reveal the ways that our mission can uniquely enliven even the most forward-thinking centers of technological and business innovation. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Jennifer Lynn Woolley as the originator and moderator of today's discussion. Dr. Woolley is an associate professor of management at Santa Clara University and a 2019-2020 Bannon Fellow. Her research focuses on entrepreneurship, innovation, and, and the emergence of firms, industries, and technologies. Her recent work examines the relationship between founding, founding teams, intellectual property, mm. public policy, and firm outcomes. Dr. Woolley's research has been published in a wide range of prestigious journals, and she has presented her work at many conferences, including the Academy of Management, Strategic Management Society, and Corporate Social Responsibility Americas Conference. She is also an editorial board member of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Business and Management. <clears throat> Dr. Willie also participated in the creation of the California Program for Entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University, an intensive training program for non-matriculating entrepreneurs. She teaches in the areas of entrepreneurship and innovation. Her consulting work focuses on helping entrepreneurs bring ideas to fruition. Um, before returning to academia, Professor Willie worked at financial, as a financial consultant and analyst with Ericsson Wireless, Ashley Kumar and Company, and Westhold Corporation. Dr. Willie and today's panelists have thought a great deal about the intersection of Jesuit education and leadership, and I look forward to a stimulating conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, okay, so we're, we haven't tested the mics. Are the mics working? We're okay? Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very excited to be leading the first Bannon uh, forum for this year, and we have a fantastic panel from across campus and different disciplines. So I want to introduce them first. Uh, from the your far right, um, Sarita Tamayo Moraga is a, in our religious studies department since 2003. She's a Zen priest and Dharma heir. Her specialty is in comparative mysticism with a focus on Zen and Catholicism, and the use of mindfulness in pedagogy and transformative scholarship and leadership. Um, then we have Reverend Dorian Llewellyn, our University Mission and Identity <coughs> Officer, Executive Director of the Ignatian Center, and uh, as a side note, Disney lover. It's <laughs> <That's> embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I told well, you that. <laughs> that's okay. There's a theme. It's, it's a pervasive across the panel, Disney. Um, but from South Wales, speaking 11 uh, languages. Hopefully, we'll just stick with English. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we have Long Lee, who's been with us in the Management and Entrepreneurship uh, Department since 2014. Teaches mainly in the international business area. Is the director of our international business minor. Um, he's also the faculty advisor to the Student Microfinance Organization. And his spe specialty is interfaith microfinance in post-conflict uh, post countries. So please welcome our panels. <laughs> and what we thought we'd do first is just start the conversation with a discussion about um, Jesuit education and bringing into account business leadership and our thoughts about our position as a home in Silicon Valley. So I first wanted to open it up to ask the question, what Jesuit education means to you? Who wants to chime in first? Turn my mic on. All right. Um, so uh, first, uh, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for the honor of asking me uh, with my um, distinguished uh, fellow panelists. So I'm in religious studies. I'm Catholic and a Zen teacher. And uh, to me, being a Jesuit teacher, uh, teaching and living, I live in one of the residential learning communities, so I really <laughs> live out the Jesuit way. Um, I'm here on campus. Um, uh, I lead meditation groups on campus. I go to mass at the Mission Church. So I tell you all of that, although it may not seem to link to Jesuit education, to tell you that what I think it means is to um, create a home for all parts of ourselves. So our spiritual part, our learning part, 
our um, uh, need for the sacred, our need for new learning. Um, there's a quote from uh, Father Nicolas, a former superior uh, general of the Jesuit uh, order um, that I've never forgotten. He said that we're not converting our students to Catholicism, we're converting them to humanity. And so that's what a Jesuit education means to me. Thanks. Um, thanks for the, I'm going to jump in on to, um, before you, Longley. Um, so uh, you mentioned Disney. I'm pretty interested in the way that, that as a corporation, Disney perpetuates itself. If you work for Disney, uh, you need to know the Disney story. Um, there's really a Disney mission, which is very clearly articulated, and it's based in the deep DNA of Walt Disney and his life and his early creations. So um, I'm instituted, very interested in the institutional DNA, how a particular institution reflects the character of its founders and, and the time in which it was founded. So um, the Jesuits were founded at the age of, the age of discovery, um, and there was a complete turnaround in how people thought of themselves in the world. Um, the, with the discovery of the, of the uh, or the encounter of cultures, uh, the world was much bigger than the people originally thought. Um, it was also religiously diverse um, within Ignatius's own lifetime, Christianity, European Catholic Christianity fractured. Uh, and at the same time then, even how the cosmos was arranged changed in Ignatius's own lifetime. So um, what it means, I think, at this point is that, that this question of discovery is actually one of those key ingredients of a Jesuit education. And um, one of the ways about thinking about this Jesuit, is about Jesuit education that it is engendered to allow people to escape from the confines of their own experience up to the, up to the present. So um, beyond zones of comfort. So inventiveness and innovation and imagination are part of what we do. Um, secondly, and Sarita has already alert, uh, alerted us to this, the uh, Jesuit education was born at the time of, of the development of re Renaissance humanism, deep, deep respect for the complexity of the human person. Um, but the, re the Renaissance humanists also rediscovered ancient wisdom as well. So I think what also one of the things that we do is historical perspective is really important so that we can learn from others' mistakes but also learn from others' experiences. Um, the Jesuits were set up to do two things, um, which was really to spread the Catholic faith, but also to uh, contribute to the welfare of society. Uh, so there's been a social remit of Jesuit education. Um, so I'd also say then, our education really has an inbuilt ethical imperative, uh, which means choosing. Uh, and the choice is never between good and bad. It is always between what is good and better. So there's a kind of a desire to improve all the time. And then finally, um, Sirita, you talked about um, education paying attention to all parts of the self. Um, you'll hear whole person everything in Santa Clara. Whole person education, you know, whole person spaghetti, I don't know, anywhere to go, but as a, um, which is, means that, that essentially this, the, there is a part of each human life which cannot be reduced to rationality. There is something which escapes our own sense of ourselves as well. So the education, therefore, is person-centered, and our decisions really take and not only a question uh, in what should I do or must I do, but if I take this path, who is the person who I will become, and what will it do to other people as well? So it's always in reference to the person. Thank you. Just to pick up um, Father Dorian in terms of choice, for me, I believe that you know, I become my choices, um, and that uh, the reason why I came to Jesu uh, Santa Clara is because my belief in um, the importance of Jesuit education. For me, what it means is knowing who you are, um, know how to love, know how to accept love, um, and know how to live with others, and know how to hope for uh, a better future, the best future. And for me, uh, I try to live it as much as I can. I try to bring that into my teaching into my research, into my service projects that I do with students. Uh, and, um, and I love it. I'm not sure what students think sometimes when I embed Jesuit principle in my business courses. Uh, but for me, I, I don't think I have been happier than I've ever been since I've been at Santa Clara. So, um, so for me, you know, I, I'm blessed that I can live with the choices that I have made. And, um, Fantastic. Thanks.
Um, and I, I'm hearing themes of the whole person, um, bringing students or converting students to humanity, but also not just making this about an education of right, wrong principles, but beyond comfort and acknowledging the ethical complexities of our choices. So being that we are in Silicon Valley and we've been, well, inundated with the news about um, business leadership in Silicon Valley, how do you think that the Jesuit education speaks to or is related to business leadership? You want me to jump in a little bit? Okay. <laughs> I have notes on this one, so. Good. Um, we don't. <laughs> I think, for me, I think when I think of Jesuit uh, spiritual, uh, um, Jesuit spirituality and business leadership or business education, I think of being compatible, but I also see it has intention. And when it's intention, the question is, what wins out? Jesuit values or business profit-oriented? Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that I would like for students to think about in my course is what type of person do they want to be and what type of world do they want to live in, particularly as many of them will work in Silicon Valley. Uh, and my job is to, in some ways, bring in that reality of, as much as I can, I try to bring in the marginalized community into my classroom. I try to bring in uh, people in the bottom of the pyramid, even though I teach international business and I focus on many of the Silicon Valley companies, uh, I take time to bring these issues in. Uh, and I find that what's interesting about our students at Santa Clara is that they have this two type of education at Santa Clara. One is, at least for business students, one is the, the hum humanity classes that they take and then when they come to the business school, sometimes they divorce those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I find is when I start to introduce some of these things, students said, oh, you know, I was in an immersion program at the Nation Center. And this is, I connect this to this and this and that. And then issues of homelessness in the Silicon Valley comes up. The question of how do I, how do I think about technology innovation in some ways and how do I, see my work in a corporation in some ways to deal with that type of issues. Um, but I don't want to get off too track, but I'll, I'll leave it as there. Um, can I? Okay. So, okay. so um, I think that Jesuit education at its best is, is about leadership. Um, I think that's what we do. Um, so whether we're in business or in any other field, I think that's what we should be, we are, and when we are at our best, we are in. Uh, producing leaders. Now, the question for me is, the query, is there any difference between Ignatian leadership and a, any other kind of leadership? Or is our practice just good practice that we get from, that you could get in any other business school or any, any other universities? Um, in certain fields, I mean, uh, the, the Ignatian and the Jesuit and the Catholic piece really have very little to say. Um, there are no Catholic electronic circuits, you know. Um, so our faith or our, 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 our um, let us say our convictions really make no difference in certain fields. But where I think they can do is actually in terms of st what I talk about, story, style, and substance. Um, I think Ignatian leadership um, really comes from, is, is inspired by faith in its roots, but it is also relevant to those who do not share the faith because it is based on the, on the human person as well. And it is profoundly um, human, and, prof and therefore because it is based in the human, it is profoundly universal. So I was reading an article yesterday with some of the deans um, just about what is Ignatian leadership. Um, for me and my job, I mean, I found the question of leadership is, is it makes me a bit squeamish in some ways because it's not, I'm not in a field which is in a management, you know, where there are no techniques as it, that way and it's something that you pick up in some ways by osmosis. Uh, the article suggested, however, that there are certain characteristics of Ignatian leadership um, which would be humility um, second would be compassion. Um, the third one is the one that caused the most uh, comment, which is the quote for freedom. Uh, and freedom in this way means not so much freedom um, 
uh, it's freedom from, but it's also freedom for. It's the freedom to be able to make those good choices in the light of what our own ultimate values, with which, without being conditioned by other, with sub-values, as it were. Um, the, one of the founding pieces in the Ignatian charism is the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, and within that, one key principle within that is flexibility. So the importance of context, uh, what St. Ignatius called peoples, times, and places. Um, so one holds the principles, but you apply them in a way which is tailored to the actual context there. Uh, which means that the education, or the leadership rather, in, when as a leader talking to people who one has responsibility for and towards, uh, it always needs to be personalized, uh, but never privatized. Um, it's individual, but it's never individualistic when it has to hold those intentions. So I think in these ways, uh, the leadership piece there, I suspect that for in Ignatian and Jesuit education, uh, the distinction actually comes in motivation. You know? Certain things are just going to be, no, that's not kosher. We're not going to do that. Um, we're not going to teach our students to be immoral or to be unethical. Uh, but I do hope that we're able to show that, the, that there is more than being ethical, as I say, that, that to move beyond the ethics into actually something which is actually, I would say, it's in the terrain of love in there. So um, I'm hearing uh, my distinguished colleagues uh, uh, beautifully present on this particular question. Um, I think I'll focus on the uh, transformation in um, the students that I work with and how it would relate to this question. And in some cases also my experience uh, leading retreats on campus and leading the meditation groups on campus, a, a couple of them. So across uh, worldviews, whether they're religious, whether they're not religious, whether they're Catholic, uh, spiritual but not religious, Jain, Sikh, Muslim, etc. What I have found is that at its best, um, Jesuit education can form leaders from any worldview um, in the ability to be oriented from a different place. So uh, I teach Zen and I also teach Catholic mysticism. And in that there's this model of ordinary awareness, um, spiritual awareness, and then connection to your sacred power, whatever that might be, in the middle and that contemplative practice intersects with social justice and with uh, internal change when you get to the middle, to the, to the center point. So of course, um, for centering prayer in Catholicism, this is God, but I teach a non-theistic version that uh, is hopefully open to all, and the students choose what their sacred is. So although I don't have the time to then relate it to the different ways I uh, uh, teach um, in other classes, the similarity is that then oriented from this place, uh, their connection to their sacred, and I think that is something Santa Clara University does very well um, across campus and across disciplines, that then they can be fearless and make choices that their parents might not want I actually have had students in my classes change careers. <laughs> That's not actually what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and I have gotten in trouble a couple of times. Um, and choose, for example, a nonprofit or go into teaching when they had been headed um, to a very different job or something their parents wanted them to do. So I offer that to um, demonstrate the way in which I think that um, my hope for Jesuit education in Silicon Valley would be that our students could um, gain the fearlessness and the knowledge to address the stark uh, moral failures of many of the technology companies in our valley who are not <laughs> oriented from that center. I'm not sure where they're oriented from, not for me to say, but uh, uh, apparently, uh, hopefully, it's not where we're asking our students to be oriented from. So I could go on and on, as you might imagine, but um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons that this forum is so dear to my heart is that I lead a class on spirituality and business leadership for our MBA students. And I also teach at the undergraduate and other MBA classes. And one of the things that we talk about is that you have an opportunity to be a leader 
every moment of every day. People are watching you, and you never know how you will or will not inspire somebody. And a leader isn't about profit. It's about values. So to get to the heart of being a strong leader is to be a values-driven person, a values-driven leader, and recognize the whole person. So these uh, responses definitely resonate with me on what I've seen in my own classroom where students haven't been or haven't acknowledged that they may be taking a finance course or um, a religion course, but really it's about their whole person and who they want to be as a values-driven leader, not about who they, what their profession is or um, what their bottom line is. And that's a, that takes some time. So building on this, why do you think that Jesuit education, especially for business leadership, is particularly important now? Have you got about 45 minutes for me to talk <laughs> nonstop? Sure, yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, at the end of September, um, there was a very big conference in the Vatican organized by the, um, um, by the Vatican. It's the second one on technology that they've done this year. Um, Brian Green from the Marcola Center and also Don, um, Don Heider were there. Um, one of the keynote speakers on day one was Reid Hoffman, um, who I think in a somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek way, Did, you know who Reed, Reed Hoffman is, so LinkedIn, okay. So, and he said, well, the thing about you've invited me here, and I should tell you that I'm in the business of making money, you know. So his, he is a I mean, values-driven person, and this is a question of which values, you know. So he said, and in a way, it was a very provocative question, you know, but it was basically saying, so if you want to get into a, a dialogue with me about values, well, I'll tell you what mine are, you know. Um, so I guess one of the challenges there is actually is that with the lack of a common moral currency, you know, and that people can talk about those things, a, a lack of shared values. Um, I meet uh, um, around, you know, in receptions to sort of meet, I meet CEOs, I meet producers of technology, like uh, just a couple of ranks below. And in many cases, what they will say, say is that personally, they have a faith commitment or a sort of an ethical commitment, but it is always kept private. Uh, because the very nature of the business, the industry itself, is that conversations around uh, values uh, co co about what ultimately matters in somebody are really, really hard to have in a public situation, in a work situation. So in a way, I think what we have ended up there with is sort of where, where I'm talking about, I guess, when convictions can be easily, pri you know, they remain at the level of, pri of being privatized, and they don't really intersect with how a business actually how actually a business actually works I think it is changing because I think some of the crises that is happening in uh, particularly in social media firms are realizing oh well actually this there are unforeseen consequences um, the last point I want to say here is that um, one really really is probably at the heart of Jesuit education is the value of reflection which means hitting the pause button and okay let's just stop and think about what's gone on so that in order where our next action can be more mindful and it can be more impactful and then we can evaluate it more effectively. The problem about it, it seems to me, is that, that the pace of technological change is such that there is not enough time built in for reflection because reflection itself is antithetical to the business where you're racing to develop the next product to get out ahead of other people. And that's where I think the Jesuit education in that case um, has a tremendous value, but is a value which may not be lovable by some sectors of, te of um, technology industries. I, um, just to pick you up on uh, Father Dorian, um, I find it it's not easy to incorporate uh, um, Jesuit spirituality in the business uh, courses because sometimes they conflict. And, and I'll give you an example, like if you are in, in the business education, design thinking is in, and design thinking is, you know, how do you understand, have empathy, how do you understand the human experience? Well, when, you, when business students or business leaders, when they see design thinking, they're like, I'm gonna use empathy to understand the consumer so I can sell more products and services. Right. Sorry. And, you know, what I'm afraid of is, you know, 
if you don't teach Jesuit uh, values and principles correctly, some students will use it in a way to serve their own interests for their own company. And I think, uh, for me, uh, it comes down to if you really believe in the Jesuit principle, uh, particularly if you are going to be future business leaders, is you have to think about what is best for the Silicon Valley and not to be the best in the Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I try to convey that as much as I can to students is how can you be the best for the Silicon Valley? And if you do that, other things may come, and it may not, I'm not sure. But if you truly have the freedom to allow the spirituality into your work uh, and detach things that are unimportant, uh, then I think maybe the outcome of our students who will be future leaders in Silicon Valley, maybe things would look differently. So I have a lot of ambivalence <laughs> about this particular issue and am a Luddite, so I will say that out loud. But I do have some thoughts. And um, the first one is that while listening um, um, to my uh, fellow distinguished panelists, what popped into my mind was uh, we didn't used to be Silicon Valley. We used to be the Valley of Heart's Delight. And so how then to, um, uh, that Silicon Valley needs a heart transplant, basically. And how could je the Jesuit values aid with that heart transplant? Um, I am actually very pessimistic, I apologize, but I am not pessimistic about the ability of um, a Jesuit education to shape leaders who could do that. And um, in terms of then thinking about changes that could be made, what the obstacle for me, even on this panel, and Jennifer I actually and I met and talked about this exact issue, is the commodification of spirituality, and in particular, the commodification of mindfulness. So um, it's actually, I think, more difficult to commodify the Ignatian exercises, <laughs> which is good, um, but it's very easy to commodify mindfulness and um, use it to make workers more productive, to uh, lessen um, uh, conflict so that you don't have, you can fire that HR person uh, that you were hoping to fire, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's the challenge. And whereas, the Abrahamic faiths, I think, have not had concrete ties to Silicon Valley businesses. Um, Zen leaders actually have. And I think in part, it's because um, uh, at least Zen itself is a, more a way of life than a religion. And then also, it's cool and trendy, and thus, uh, it doesn't appear to be a threat. So um, lastly, though, um, my perhaps subversive hope is um, that then shaping um, our students as leaders uh, from a, an Ignatian and Jesuit perspective, and, and that does not necessarily at all mean that they have to be Catholic, that then they themselves would subvert um, at, in their leadership positions. And my personal hope would then be that we could um, uh, return to um, the Valley of Heart's Delight as opposed to um, Silicon Valley as our identifier. I have a quick question for Father Dorian that I wanted to ask him quite a, uh, quite a bit. I know Father Dorian from the number of things we, we have. No, I but... didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is, do you think, whether it's Jesuit education or Jesuit spirituality, can it be taught or is it caught? Oh, that's a really good question, because you're really talking about two parts of the human person. Um, the catching bit would be perhaps the more experiential, the more effective piece, um, and then taught would be the more intellectual piece. So, so what I taught you at the beginning was actually some facts about Jesuit education, the history of the DNA and how that affects its way through. I think that can be actually, as a start, that's a way in, you know? We're an intellectual community as a university. I think that's a piece of, piece of, a piece of information. The effective things, and, it's, and actually I think it was Jennifer or, or who mentioned it, is the question of time and reflection. Um, 
What I do wonder about this is that in terms of, there may be a question of age and stage appropriateness. For those of you who are undergraduate students, the questions that, uh, the existential questions would be very different from somebody who's like, who's, who's, who's in their mid, who's mid-career. You know? um, the other question then in terms of our education is that uh, our business school has significant investment in graduate education. And the graduate education experience is always very different because you don't then, it's largely not residential. You are actually, it's much more in terms of actually skills acquisition. Uh, there I think along, it's actually, it's more difficult to, to, uh, to put that in. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to talk about your business and spirituality course and what you've, what you've been doing in that. Well, to piggyback some of the things that have been discussed and the next where we're going with this conversation is that one of the things that we offer as the Jesuit school or University of Silicon Valley is the opportunity to reflect at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, whatever it is, this is a place that's safe to reflect on these issues before getting into those situations. And I, I always tell people, especially entrepreneurs, time is a luxury. And when you're in the heat of the moment and you're making decisions, you don't have time to reflect on who you are and what your values are. But if you've established that ahead of time, you actually had the opportunity to consider your own foundation, whatever it might be, that gives you a much more solid place to make those decisions. And that is one of the things that we offer as, as Santa Clara. Um, what do you guys think in terms of Santa Clara and, and what we have to offer? What do we excel at? This was not a trick question. <laughs> I, I actually had an immediate hit. And I think we excel at humanizing um, people, movements, ideas that uh, others have told us are inhuman. So immersion programs, humanize uh, the unhoused, humanize um, other, other uh, you know, areas where perhaps there are gangs, humanize um, uh, uh, an idea, for example, about a, a different way to uh, run an economy, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, uh, so that is uh, something I see across disciplines and um, across different units of the university. Certainly, it's often aspirational, but I think that it is uh, something we excel at. Um, can I chime in? And I think, I mean, again, in conversations that I have, and it's often with an older generation of people, as I meet people, as I, a number of people who are alumni here tell me how really in their Jesuit education at Santa Clara, they've taken it through with the whole of their careers. Uh, I'm a theologian, so I'm quite happy to boast that they say it's often their theology and, th and philosophy classes that they've actually carried most forward. So it's made them different kinds of leaders uh, as they've gone on. Um, w you know, one ethical theory talks about, uh, you know, it's, it's virtue ethics. And it, to Jennifer, to pig piggyback on what you're saying, I think at its best, our education, we talk about it as being formation, transformational, but also formation. So a virtue in this case is something that is a bit like a muscle that you develop by constant practice. So it becomes a second nature. So effectively, when you are in the heat of the moment and you do not have time to sit down and discern and to enter into your Zen position and, right. and for the right emergent to say, somehow you have resort, ethical and moral reserves that you can draw on that, uh, in there. And I think that is what makes that at its best, I think that's the way it works. Well, I'm going to be out there. So I'm going to say, in terms of Jesuit principle in the business school, I think the business school has a ways to go. Uh, I would say that in part, in, if, you, if you believe in Jesuit education in terms of being taught, what tends to happen is when we hire people, we don't ever, we don't ever account whether their values align with uh, Santa Clara mission. We hope that it does, but we never, uh, uh, you know, during the hiring process, uh, Jennifer probably know more than I do, uh, I just assume that it doesn't come up, 
And if it doesn't come up, it's, it's miss or, you know, it likely there's a reason why the business school doesn't do well in teaching Jesuit principle or integrating the classroom because we don't hire on those bases. That could be wrong, uh, but that's, that's just my, my feeling. Um, so I think there's much more to, uh, that can be done in terms of top down. I think in bottom up, I think it is, uh, um, it is the responsibility of business educator to allow the spirituality into their teaching. If you're gonna be at a Jesuit business school, then you would have to think about it. And, and I, you know, Andre de Beck, who used to be the dean of business school, he would say, you know, you have to give yourself some space and time uh, to think about how to bring that spirituality in the classroom. And we do have activities, not to say that we don't at Santa Clara for faculty to think about these things, such as the Ignatian uh, Faculty Forum, the orientation when, when, when uh, faculty are hired. Uh, but most part, I don't think it's, it's very structured or very consistent to say to our professor, hey, you, know, you, you, need, to, you need to think about this. But that's just my opinion. So if I make a comment on that. So one of, one of the, th I would differentiate there between graduate and undergraduate education. Because with undergraduate education, we have the core curriculum. You know, we have the common with the common. Co we have a core curriculum. We have residential life. Uh, we have four years generally for most students uh, to there to spend time with. So, but time is so precious for a graduate student. And those of you who are in MBA would you know get a sense of this that essentially you are just learning the skills. So the challenge to impart a kind of what would be a distinctive and say this is what makes this place. This is what makes my education different from yours if you went to the Stanford Business School. I think it, it's, um, it's actually much, it's, it's much harder to do it there. I don't have an easy answer to that about how you would do it within graduate education. Yeah. That is something that we look at in terms of <clears throat> principal leadership. Um, that is a core part of our business education at the undergraduate and at the MBA level. Ethics are pervasive as a topic of discussion. So it's not as though we haven't discussed that. Um, but we all have challenges. What other challenges do you see um, for Santa Clara as a whole? Where can we improve? Across discipline, across discipline. And, um, and I was just fortunate enough to um, be part of the faculty immersion and there I met Father uh, Mark Fusco and he has a love for uh, business and uh, artificial intelligence, and through that conversation and through our time together, we were able to create a co-teaching course uh, based on accounts has a religious uh, uh, RTC3, uh, where it's um, bis bis uh, design theory, innovation, and Jesuit principles. And, um, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to kind of meet somebody who is different, who, not different, but <laughs> a Jesuit, and, and brings, you know, and, and, and that really just, uh, that cross-discipline relationship collaboration, I think is, it, it could be done better. I have a, a fantasy that um, we would all get more than the one hour, an academic year for the Mass of the Holy Spirit where everything is canceled so there could be meetings or there could be these um, fruitful times in our own department, religious studies department, we're struggling to find times to know what each other is doing, to support one another, to reflect. We cannot reflect together because we cannot all be in the same place at the same time together. And the only time in all 30 weeks that the administration tells us this one hour you must, you can, well I'm sure people take naps or not everyone goes to the Mass of the Holy Spirit, but it is the time where everything is canceled and that is approved. And so I have this fantasy that we would go back to at least once a month, that this one hour you cannot, that's not for teaching, it's not for um, uh, a meeting, it's not for, uh, and you will get paid for this hour, and it's for your department to learn what the other person is doing, to reflect. We do not get time for reflection. And, um, and then the faculty staff retreats are, are few and far between as well, um, and uh, so I'll stop there. Um, so I'm thinking back to a speech that Father O'Brien gave in Hakima University, uh, he gave the key in this uh, last summer, 
um, which is a fascinating and somewhat scary speech um, because um, he provides you know, what you'd expect people to talk about Je Jesuit education, but he actually then goes into some very challenging language. Uh, and really, it's a call to at least to be free to consider the possibility of a radical alternative mm -hmm. to Jesuit education. Um, now, our dirty little secret is that academia is a highly conservative industry. We don't do change very easily, and we like our hierarchies, and we like our ranks, and we are slower to adapt than just about any other industry. Am I right or am I right? Yeah. Um, wait, wait. <laughs> Give me a week to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to put it through a committee first. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and a vote. Um, <laughs> So I, I think, for me, the, kind of the wish list, as it would be, to, write, to imagine, can we allow ourselves the freedom to imagine uh, what this might look differently? Now, we are a tuition-driven university, so the money has to actually come in uh, through the front door in order for us to pay salaries uh, and in order to provide an, excel uh, an excellent education to our students, particularly the increasing number of students who are going to need significant amounts of uh, financial aid. So in a way, what we are trying to do at the same time is to be an excellent university, because that's what we were set up to do, is to provide an excellent education. Um, I think our task is really to always to question and to ponder and to allow us the, ourselves the freedom to say, well, what is excellence in education anyway, let alone Jesuit education? What does that consi consist of? What is our industry? What is our end product? And wh why do we exist? You know? um, and I go back to that kind of original Ignatian Disneyland piece there, you know, in the DNA. We exist, amongst other things, for the welfare of society, you know. So we have a social remit, mm -hmm. you know. We are, so, we are, a, we, uh, and I think that's important not to lose that. So it's not only about producing individuals, it's about the effect that those individuals will have for generations to come. So we're investing in our students, particularly our undergraduates, not only for what, they, what they're getting now, but who they will, what kind of leader they will be in 40, 50 year times when, when somebody, who, somebody, she started her own startup and then is now runs a, a, a million dollar business. Any final thoughts on that one? Okay. Well, I think this would be a great opportunity to open up the floor for questions and it, um, from uh, you all from the audience. Are there any questions that you have for our panelists? Every now and then uh, a question comes out, up about whether um, Jesuit values should be included in faculty evaluation, staff evaluation. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Is there a getaway car here I can <laughs> get into? <laughs> So um, uh, the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, the plight of fixed term faculty and um, temporary staff uh, and those who uh, cannot lose their job because of health healthcare benefits or whatever, for whatever reason, or those who have um, uh, a three and a half one hour commute, or rather one way commute and a three and a half hour one way commute back home. And so unless it is accompanied by training, unless it's accompanied by pilots, uh, and certainly I would welcome that, but not unsupported and not without some type of uh, investment top down and bottom up. And so um, I think the most vulnerable among us who um, uh, statistically are disproportionately impacted by the evaluations would be those who might be left out, uh, hung out to dry. So I, that is what worries me. I would love for it to happen, but not without a lot of infrastructure, a lot of accountability for those who are training people in the mission, and, um, and then some type of appeals process if um, there has been no training, but the person is fired anyway. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes, yes. That's good. You know, it's a really interesting question because in some ways you might argue, well, first of all, if you were going to do that, you'd really need to be very clear about what are Jesuit, what if somebody's going to be evaluated, you know, tell her what she's going to be evaluated on, make it clear to her, and then, you know, give her. Um, but in some ways I would actually argue that they already are. 
that, that our faculty are already, because teaching, uh, scholarship and service, um, if we are think about them properly, they are already manifestations of Jesuit values. You know, because that's it, they, they um, but I think probably what we need, I would say there, is actually to be able to explain that better. And why is it to be a good teacher is a value in, within a Jesuit university. Why scholarship itself, just the life of the mind, you know, that kind of, that tradition of just what, it, of kind of, technically, <clears throat> it was called pious learning. Um, that scholarship itself, actually studying what, you know, if you're writing a book on the history of Armenian shoelaces, um, if it's, it's actually a kind of holy act. There's something about discovery, about learning in itself and the search for truth, which is already a Jesuit value. And then certainly service is right at the heart of what we do. So service to one's colleagues, certainly service to one's, uh, to one's, uh, to, uh, one's students, and then service to the wider community. And that would include our wider community would be to the world of Silicon Valley. I think for me, um, I probably would, would not support that. However, I would support something like uh, Ignatian Faculty Forum, where uh, faculty is an invitation, where if you get in it, maybe you get a course off, and there you can engage Jesuit principal or Jesuit education based on where you are at. Because you know it, it, it's, it's, it's where you're at, and, and, and the more that we have those opportunities where we give incentive for faculty to think about, reflect, mm -hmm. uh, and give them incentive, whether it's a course off or half a course off or service or a big major service, uh, I think that's probably the way to go. And the Gates Faculty Forum has had a huge impact. Really huge, yes. Huge. But, but I do want to bring it back to Disneyland um, again in this sense because in the, no, it's a really, it's a, it's a cogent example because if you work for Disneyland, if you are the lady who puts the, the, the invisible ink on your hands so you can go out to the gate and come back in again, you need to know something about the uh, institution and you probably need to like Mickey Mouse, you know. Um, so there's a se sense Not in... Not like Mickey Mouse. Yeah, well, there are people, <laughs> so they could be. Um, but I insist that, so it's a question of sort of uh, brand adherence is probably not the right word, but, but identification that there needs to be something within the organization with its whole ethos that so you can say, somehow I'm part of this and this is part of me. You know, and that's the ideal to which we're, we're working. And I think that would be true of this university, but also if I was running a company, and God bless the company that I would run, um, that's what I would want for the people that I work with. You know, that's some of this issue where we're all in this together. So that the mission, the values is not imposed, but it's freely espoused because people think it's good. Thank you. So, uh, hi. The uh, Levy Business School has an executive center, and that's where I work. So I work in the Silicon Valley Executive Center. Uh, which provides executive education to companies that come in and they get training and formation in various areas. Sometimes it's certification, sometimes it's leadership, sometimes it's, it's basic management. So my question is, uh, what, would, what would you advise me and people in the center to do to reflect more the Jesuit values and these things that you've all been discussing in ways that are not just going to be palatable to people, but are actually going to be, uh, uh, they're, they're able to, to act on them and to make them real. Because one of the things I was also thinking about is that uh, people know what to do. They know what the right answer is. The question becomes, how do you do it? And so, which is why I like Father Dorian, you're, you're uh, bringing up virtue ethics, because you know, how do you give people the courage to do that? So my, my question then is, can you help me <laughs> work with, uh, uh, executives in Silicon Valley to so that they can be re, we can reflect more of our our own mission thank you I'm gonna cop out on that one and say the way to deal with the current situation is to invest in the undergraduate students I think that the undergraduate students see themselves as leaders and we should see them as leaders and we should equip them with uh, and you know whether it's a stipend for them to to learn how to understand homelessness, 
so that when they get into a corporation, they can then, then they can promote this company, the, the, the company that I work in, I want you to do more on homelessness. And I want you to have some type of activities to do this. So I, I think that, um, I think importantly, I think we need to really do more and invest more uh, in our undergraduate uh, business students because they, uh, like you said, everybody has a leader to play no matter what role in the company that you're in. And companies today are looking for talented and, and they care what the you know, new crop of students uh, uh, view on the environment, view on, on corporate social responsibility and things like that. And it used to be that we would have um, the spirituality and organizational leadership course for our executive MBA um, cohorts. And I've seen over time a larger hunger for these types of topics. We can offer that. We have talent on campus that can speak to these issues for the Silicon Valley Executive Center. And I guess for you, it's a matter of determining what those are, what it is that they want from us as, as a home. We offer a lot of different programs for our executive um, teaching. Well, what, what do you want? We'll, we'll figure out a way to do it, I think, is kind of the ethos that we, we use at Santa Clara. It's, we will figure out a way to help whoever we can. I wonder if also, there's a question we talk about time and reflection, and Sarita, you talked about the way that mindfulness is now packaged as an app. Um, Literally. Uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, one of the most frenzied students I ever taught is now a major marketing manager for Calm. Um, so, <laughs> so, so um, uh, but I, I do wonder, and it may be that certain things just aren't transmittable. The format itself, if you have people who are coming to you for a five, for a, you know, five sessions, it may be that some, so Ignatian's, yeah, that Ignatian worldview, the Jesuit values, that, I mean, what, whatever, whatever we call it, maybe you can't package it in five, five sessions. Mm -hmm. It just may not fit into that. It just may require more time, more, uh, and a greater openness to that. So I. I would worry about the potential commodification of this, because you're really talking about, you know, about human formation. Human, I mean, we are complex, and we take time to mature, you know, and, to, and particularly to, uh, in, when we're learning new things, you know, which actually change our sense of self. Yeah. So I have a crazy idea, um, and I don't know if you have any type of immersive part in terms of um, uh, thriving neighbors or, you know, there's so many partners. Um, but I suggest that they spend the night in St. James Park and live for a day on one dollar um, and uh, wear clothes that are ragged and try to get along. Um, and uh, I think that would be, have a, a quite the uh, impact. I'd love to see you market that. Uh, I've, I'm trying, <laughs> but I'm not a business yeah. person. Yeah. So I am in the MBA program and I also work in the Ignition Center uh, and I'm about halfway through the program and my reflection so far is you would not know that we were at a Jesuit university unless you were actively looking for that. Uh, it was, I think, maybe casually mentioned in the orientation and almost as an apology, um, sort of a, an afterthought, oh yeah, we're at Jesuit university. Uh, and through the classes, I think it's only been ma maybe mentioned once by a professor. I know that the spirituality and leadership course has been offered, but that's only been offered on, on Saturdays. And so in terms of accessibility, um, because it's not integrated in a concrete, very noticeable way, you, you'd have to sort of seek it out. And so I wonder if, um, be really possible to go through the program and get a very strong Jesuit MBA without knowing that, uh, that that is actually infused with some Jesuit values. And so I wonder if you find it valuable or important for the fact that we're at a Jesuit university to be explicitly named um, and to be discussed as to how that looks different than an MBA from Stanford or um, you know San Jose State University. Because I'm not sure that my, my cohort or my classmates would know that they were getting a Jesuit MBA. So from the faculty standpoint, it's too bad that you don't know because it's embedded in everything we do. And maybe it's the silence 
that is not being heard, um, the undercurrent, um, because we design courses and curriculum with the Jesuit mission in, in mind. And I'm not sure how things are marketed, so I apologize. Um, but it is definitely part of who we are as an institution and even as an MBA. We do think about very deeply, even in our accreditation, how are we distinct? How are we Jesuit? How are we adding value to an MBA beyond just being an MBA? We are not just any MBA. How that's perceived, though, I have no idea. So I, I, I'm not in the, I'm not in the marketing part. So it is there, and maybe it needs to be a bigger presence, but it's definitely part of our DNA. So I'm thinking here. Thank you, Charles, um, for being there and asking that intelligent question. Um, if you were enroll uh, currently at Santa Clara as an undergraduate, I, I think the view book it's called, it's designed for 17 year olds. And uh, it's largely a lot of pictures. Um, and it's I think about 30 pages long. Um, it's page 17 into the book before you find the word Jesuit written into it. And, there, and it's not explained. Why? Because it is marketed at 17 year olds who maybe come from a very re religiously diverse background. Um, I think that's actually, probably the right decision. Um, I'm told anecdotally, uh, Jennifer, and this is, you know, this is, is this getting broadcast somewhere, you know, so, okay, all right, so I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I guess in the question, so let me pause it as a question for those of us who are in marketing for different parts of the university. Do we lead with the word Jesuit in it? Where do we bring that into that, about, about, oh, that, dis about that. that distinctive? So the second general of the, um, of the Society of Jesus, uh, a man called Father Lainis, uh, came up with a phrase as Jesuit education, we go into our students' doors in order to bring them out through ours. So somewhere along the way, which means that you don't necessarily need to lead with explicitly with these things, but you do need to make sure that somehow that they don't, that people are affected and changed and transformed by that as well. Um, so I think in that way, it's a question of tactics, about the strategy. I would argue, well, I mean, this is a bit theoretical, but I think um, implicit values are good, um, but we also could make them more explicit as well. Uh, and one of the great challenges in a complex organization like ours is we have very many m moving parts, and a university is a bit like a federation, you know, and, um, or a conglomeration of states, and that, you know, quite often, we discovered that somebody else is doing something we knew nothing about, you know, or they're doing it in a very different way. Or indeed, our terminology is so fluid and loose. So if you ask people, you know, what does it mean, you know, what's a bronco? Give me five characteristics of a bronco or a bronchex. Um, you would um, you would come up with a very different, you know, very different list as well. So I think we have. I would say as the university, and I'd say as the mission and uh, 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 mission identity guy. We have some work to do in articulating these things in a more meaningful way, and particularly to get beyond our, ter our usual jargon and to get actually the real human meaning of these things, why these things matter, you know, and why. I'm convinced that our education is different. Um, I think we're pretty, uh, we have some work to do about m explaining that better. I think two things can be true. I think in terms of the, the institution, I think I definitely agree with Jennifer in terms of the Jesuit piece is embedded and, also, and explicitly and marketing too as well. I think what the, the, the missing part is in the classroom ah. is, is the, 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 in, mm -hmm. in terms of the classroom, the Jesuit education doesn't get into the business school like it should. Um, so on the institutional level, the, the, the top leaders realize that I need to embed I need to be explicit with Jesuit, but in the classroom, I, I'm not sure if it gets all the way in there. So I, I see the difference between institutions and in the classroom. I think we might want to be careful about that since we're not in the classrooms. Um, yeah. so, because I know some people take it very seriously. And yeah. um, some of our students are definitely in, impacted on, uh, on a per class level. So 
I would love to get more feedback, but that's something that may be an area of growth. I, well, definitely an area of growth for us. That, that's great to hear that, because um, so I did the wedding um, last year of a young yeah, a couple, and the, the gentleman who married was a civil um, engineer and graduate from here. Um, and I asked him this precisely this conversation, you know, what is, what's the difference between people who graduate from civil engineering here and they do from, say, Stanford? Um, his comment was really interesting. He said that, that you know, that, that first of all, the business leaders recognize the human skills. Um, that actually the kind of the, just the interpersonal relation skills are there, but it's also he said something about the willingness to learn, you know. Uh, and as things evolve, five years down the road, you know, your field is not going to look like it is now. So instead of having it all packaged, you know, the, the, he said that Santa Clara student, uh, engineering students have the they have the reputation that they 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 learn on the job. They may arrive with less skills than other people when they arrive, but then they're but they're humble enough, I think, in that to learn a well. And that that in itself, I think, is a you know is tremendously attractive value. Thank you. Um, I teach in the School of Engineering, um, but I don't teach engineering. Um, um, I teach innovation theology um, and um, innovation of design and spirituality at the, gradu at the graduate level. So there's some things going on in the engineering school. My question to um, the pan any of you on the panel, or all of you, um, we talk a lot, the, the phrase Jesuit values is used a lot. Um, if, so whatever we mean by that and going deeper um, is part of this question, but it seems the reason for that question is not just get specific. Um, it's a belief I have because business is all about value. <laughs> and if they don't produce value, if they're in a competitive context, they die. Um, so uh, there is exchange value, which neoclassical economists focus on. Transaction value would be another word for it. It's what markets do and move. We can call it the financial economy. 
And then there is something called the real economy or instrumental value, and then there's intrinsic value. And I think what we mean by Jesuit values is we, we're pointing to intrinsic value. But I'm wondering if you could comment, does, does the Jesuit value show up in, 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 in instrumental value as well as transactional uh, or exchange value? I, I'm extremely dubious, lately about the, the use of the phrase Jesuit values. Um, uh, because I think it's a philosophically, it comes out of a, uh, it's, it, from a certain point, and I, I actually don't like it, and I don't use the phrase Jesuit values, and if I can possibly use that. I will use the phrase Jesuit characteristics, uh, and I will use Jesuit virtues, uh, but the question of values, I think, is a little fuzzy around the edges, so I mean, I often, if you ask a cross-section of undergraduate students here, what, uh, or indeed faculty or staff, you know, what are Jesuit values, you know, I don't think we'd come up with a particularly cogent list, nor would they be able to make the distinction that you make be between, be between those. So, so for me, this speaks to, to uh, again, work that we have to do in actually more clearly articulating what is the nature, what does it mean to be this Jesuit Catholic University in this time and in this place? And what is the, and what is the con positive contribution that we can make to the common good, to the welfare of society? Follow up on that, Doreen. Is yeah. there a mechanism in the university where that happens? No. Or should happen? Well, there isn't at the moment. So it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Well, nobody <laughs> owns the responsibility. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen, but currently, you know, there is no committee for defining what Jesuit do you think values. We uh, I think it's part. I think it, I think Father Brian is moving us in that direction. At the same time, these, these are questions that we do approach in, in business leadership, um, in say entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, the Miller Center, um, many initiatives that we have on campus that we do look at these types of questions. Um, in my own research, I've looked at beyond economic value, what are the other characteristics of value that businesses actually attend to? And in terms of social entrepreneurship, it's the application of a business model to actually overcome or at least attend to societal needs. How that's defined yeah. is not necessarily economic, and there are thousands of ways that you can actually create value that's not about the profit, about the uh, individual dollar sign. And that's something that we discuss in the entrepreneurship courses, in the innovation courses, because it is relevant to everybody. And whether or not they are in entrepreneurs or um, you know, taking their first job, how they add value and how the, how the business, whatever type of organization it is, adds value beyond the profit is actually something that's important to people at an individual heart scale. They, yes, they want to be in a, at a successful company, but they care about what values they are actually helping enable. And so it is something that we do attend to. Um, I don't know if we, they do that in the engineering school, but it is core to the Jesuit values, however they're defined, or Jesuit characteristics, because it's important to the person as a whole. There was another question or two back in the back. I guess. It I, I don't come as a critic. I'm 91 years old and I first came to the Silicon Valley back in 1942 when uh, there were 75,000 people in San Jose. And I want to address the first of my issues to the woman on the right here. Do you know anything about the late Bishop Frank Quinn and his sleeping on the streets of San Francisco uh, in 1968? Uh, he slept on the streets for four nights to see what the homeless problem was. And as the Bishop of, San Jose, of Sacramento, he was instrumental in getting the city fathers into the transfer of the Travis Air Force Base into a magnificent uh, rehabilitation center. I would recommend that you get some information on that. You don't have to go down to St. James Park. But, uh, <laughs> No, that's a beautiful story, and certainly right now what inspires me is bishops at the border when ICE is dumping immigrants or um, uh, uh, I'm from Texas, 
Uh, and um, so not a parallel story. I did not know this one, so thank you for that. I will look it up. Uh, the other, uh, I, I refer to the man over here with the Jesuit uh, type of things. I, I, I'm Jesuit school. I have a master's degree in psychology from USF, and we have seven lawyers in our family out of USF. And the last football club, kicker on the Santa Clara football teams uh, before they became defunct was a McMahon from Butte, Montana, and uh, he's my first cousin. So I, I'm a Santa Clara man at heart. Okay, um, basically, uh, I'm disappointed in the sense that uh, I don't hear the, the things, nothing of Vatican II and uh, the Jesuit values. I mean, I, everybody got upset. I mean, everybody got turned upside down, and you've got a Jesuit pope that uh, he, he's willing to say, who am I to judge? And, and the famous picture, he's like uh, David's uh, thinker uh, watching a group of people, listening to them. And, and I think, I, I guess th this is the thing that I, you're speaking about excelling. How do you excel when, you're, when we're all on the bottom rungs of the ladder? We, we haven't even got to first base yet. And, and I'm not trying to be critical of you. It is a most difficult experience. You know, we're fighting for a church to stay alive, for heaven's sake, and, and, and so forth. I, I, I'm all for what you're doing, but at the same time, are you looking at the past, the history of what has already been done? Can, I, how, can I jump in there? Thank you. Because um, uh, there's one lady I'm conscious in front of you. So when I talk about, when I was talking about the importance of looking at the past, I would say yes, I think we do. But we're also future focused as well. The past gives us our path to our, our path towards the future. But as an educational business, uh, where our, our investment is in the students, uh, so it's important to know that history. Uh, it's important to know the global context uh, as well. But yes, thank you, ma'am. Hi, so I don't know if this is so much a question as an I wonder statement, but uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm in love with it, when, in the Ignatian model is how it gifts me a gaze that is um, not immediately my own. So where I might see scarcity, I'm invited by St. Ignatius and the sacred to consider that perhaps the fruit has not been born because the seed is still underground. So when I sit and I practice the examine, I'm asked not to pit consolation and desolation against each other. There's no competition here. There's two movements that I'm asked to listen to. And um, I'm asked to imagine beyond my own vision and to take on God's gaze as much as I possibly can. And so even when the world seem, the, the road seems to be ending, perhaps it's just, it's just turning. Um, so I, I'm wondering in, in this Ignatian model with business, is there an opportunity to uh, create some companioning or some partner, partnering with executives who are developing their own friendship, it sounds like, not only with themselves, but perhaps with the world? Are there spiritual directors who can who can sit with an executive and not just say, you had an immersion, immersive experience, but how is it with your soul now that you have had an immersive experience? Because in my experience, I may not have time for reflection, but my soul is not gonna shut up. If it, if it is discontented or contented, it will rattle within me until I pay attention, and it will get louder until I do. But without the priests and the and the the women's groups and the the friends that have come alongside me in my life, I wouldn't have this cap capacity to listen, which is still growing. So that that's my I wonder statement. Do we have companionable listening at all all levels in this institution? Oh. Um. This is a reasonable question. Well, uh, so I think it's here, but you have to look for it. Um, um, and uh, but I have to say, Rob, first I thought there's your <laughs> there's your answer. You should speak with this woman after <laughs> after uh, we close. Um, 
so I actually do not feel qualified to fully answer your question, but I think that um, there are opportunities. Um, there are pockets where this can happen. Uh, the Ignatian Faculty Forum has been mentioned uh, multiple times. Um, uh, and so there are ways for that to happen. But again, I think personally, this is my personal view, um, that because uh, there is not, or at least it appears to me, um, there's no time carved out for that, that we will pay you for this or we will, you know, that one hour of the Mass of the Holy Spirit type of thing, that um, everyone, I think, has good intentions and could seek it out but gets overwhelmed, or that I, this is what I see in people who come to me, and then, um, uh, and then I get overwhelmed. Uh, and so, um, I'll stop there. I guess may I respond to that, I mean, both as a spiritual director myself and somebody who's, I mean, both administrator, trainer, and faculty at the same time. But I mean, I guess the thing is with, what's the purpose of a university? Is the that it brings up. And who is, who is our primary audience? And I would say uh, it's our students. Um, so with all respect that I think executive is, is, is one more ingredient that we, you know, that we could do. But we, can, we could have a university without executive education. We couldn't have a university without, without undergraduates and graduate students. So it's, a, so it's a question in terms of resources in there. And then where do we, where do we concentrate our resources? Uh, and where do we not duplicate in the sense that we're not a retreat center. Uh, there are retreat centers in the area. Uh, but I, I would say in contact with you, and I, you, your comments about the soul is really important. What I would say this is where, this is where it may be antithetical to the word. A CEO generally does not have time hardly to speak to their family, let alone, you know, I mean, because they're, and when your time, when you need to make your, your figures by the end of the quarter, um, there isn't much time for contemplation. Uh, it may be then that retired, see, you know, people are out, the agent stage might be a, a, a appropriate for that. But um, institutionally, I'm finding it hard to imagine that that they would be, you know, a, that we could make that. Much as I think it's a beautiful idea to give it, you know, as a priority. Yeah. Last question. Pastor. When I think of Disney, I think of Steve Jobs. Oh, and he, yeah. he had a really, he had a really nice uh, saying: "More power, the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller." Yeah, mm. we had a bunch of stories here. That was really, so. But um, uh, transparency is what Father O'Brien was talking about. He was talking about principle-based, transparent leadership. Yeah. Um, how do you see a more transparent Santa Clara becoming? Well, that's a good question. Not that it's bad. I, I think that's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, I, I think that's a great question, a fantastic question, but that's coming from Father O'Brien. That's something that the administration will really have to tackle first. Um, I have a sense that faculty and staff would definitely appreciate it, um, and it does have to be both bottom up and top down. I think any organization that functions well needs good communication but in, in both directions. So um, telling people what, what is happening and why it's happening uh, and, not, and not allow, I mean, the, it, it, it avoids an awful lot of misunderstandings that way. But yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, appropriately, um, that's certainly an, a, a goal to aim for. Uh, you know, our Catholic moral tradition is, is like Italian traffic lights. Um, which is, you know, the difference. So Anglo-Saxon law is based on the fact that you must have law, you have laws, and then you have to obey them. But you have the minimum amount of, amount of laws. Uh, Roman law is based on the on the idea that you aim towards the ideal. So what's an Italian traffic light? It's a suggestion. <laughs> so that's I think. So the question within the Ignatian tradition, the the, the code word is magis, which really means more authentic, more intimate. Um, it's not about doing more. So if we are pointing in the right direction, that's good enough. Yeah. So I was on the Campus Climate Committee, um, uh, and we had the Campus Climate, uh, 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 so much work done um, in order to try to anonymously uh, take the pulse of the university at all levels and across all units. 
And so I think that that is part of the effort of uh, making things more transparent. Um, and it's slow, and it's bumpy, uh, and uh, it's, def it's definitely not perfect, uh, but I think it is a goodwill uh, uh, gesture towards this transparency. Um, I think that an area of transparency that um, I would like to see is um, to focus on solidarity with the vulnerable on our own campus as much as focusing on solidarity with the vulnerable off campus. That that part, I think, is not very transparent right now. And this is my anecdotal, personal view. Um, and so I think that that is an area of growth for the transparency on our campus. Well, thank you all for uh, coming. I'm going to close our panel now. And I want to um, provide a thank you to all our panelists. And thank you all for coming again. Um, thank you for being here and for such a fantastic conversation. Great. Thank, thank you, you Jennifer. Thank you. And I'd like so to thank uh, Dr. Right Willie as well for, for facilitating the conversation. And we hope to see you at our next event. So have a wonderful evening.